Welcome everyone to our 2024 series of OTF Connects webinars. My name is Peter Beans, and I'm honored to be your moderator for today's session with Wade Repta, entitled Managing the Physicality of Teaching, Physical Wellness and Ergonomics. This is the first of three wellness webinars Wade will be doing with us over the coming weeks. Before we begin, I'd like to do a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge first and foremost that we are gathered in the province of Ontario on the traditional territories of various Indigenous peoples who have been present on this land known as Turtle Island since time immemorial. We acknowledge that this has been a meeting ground for generations. We are grateful to the stewards and caretakers of this land. As advocates, teachers and educators, we understand our collective responsibility to honour, protect and sustain this land. We further recognize and honor within the membership of OTF those who are indigenous to this land. This practice of recognizing the ancestral and traditional lands in which we work, live and play is a concrete action that we undertake as a first step towards reconciliation between Canadians and the indigenous peoples of this land. But it is not our only step. Collectively and individually, we must seek to denounce the injustices and wrongs that have been committed against the First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples and to dedicate ourselves to cultivating and maintaining relationships based on mutual respect and truth. For today's OTF Connects webinar, we have Wade Repta, Vice President of Human Works, co-founder of Human Works Press, and author of The Well Teacher. Wade is an occupational therapist who has worked with teachers and educators for over 20 years to help them minimize barriers and remain working in the classroom. He has provided many years of clinical support to Human Works consultants and continues to work with teachers throughout BC as part of the BCTF Health and Wellness Program and the Well Teacher Groups. Wade's passion and commitment to the well-being of teachers compelled him to write The Well Teacher, a resource guide that empowers teachers to take greater control of their own wellness. He believes that with the information found in this book, teachers will have a better understanding of their own, of their own wellness, ultimately enabling them to thrive in the classroom. Wade leads the development of specialized products and services related to The Well Teacher, and his goal is to reach as many teachers as possible to help them remain well in their classrooms. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Wade. Okay, so that was a pretty good intro. I don't really probably have too, too much more to say um, uh, other than I'm happy to be here. Uh, the reason why I'm here, I think, um, as Peter mentioned, is to talk about physicality of teaching. We're, we're a pretty small group, so, you know, I'm hoping that if you have questions, you can, yeah, like Peter said, just put up your hand or you can either even just like blurt it out, just stop me from what I'm doing and go ahead and ask your question. At the end of the day, it's a huge topic and, you know, we couldn't cover it all anyway, to be honest, in an hour. So if you have specifics that you want to have covered regarding your own situation um, or some people that you're supporting, I know people here in different roles, by all means, just go ahead and fire it out. Um, a little bit about me just quickly. I am from Hamilton, uh, I but I've lived out here now for 20 years, work with teachers directly. The, the BCETF has uh, what's called the Health and Wellness Program. So I'm an OT with that program. And my day-to-day -day is really working like one-on-one -on -one with teachers in the schools, <clears throat> just on Zoom, uh, helping people be well. A lot of accommodation, a lot of work with uh, the local presidents and, and vice presidents. Uh, in the school districts. So we we work directly with the districts on accommodations. And a big part of that is, is a lot of it is physical stuff around accommodation and trying to get people set up as they need to to be in their classroom. Uh, as I mentioned, wrote The Well Teacher, and that's kind of how I became a little bit <clears throat> more of a speaker across the country was just from the work we'd done through The Well Teacher, which we wrote really just to get the word out about wellness. We work with a very small percentage of teachers. The program we do is voluntary. We work with a lot of people, but you know, we had all this information we thought we would share. So that's kind of where that came from. Like I said, it's a huge day. Now, the physicality of teaching, it's not the most exciting subject in the world, to be honest. Uh, there's lots of things to think about. But when we're talking about physical wellness, it's it's it can get a little dry. So like I said, go ahead and ask questions. I'm going to keep things moving. But if I'm moving too quickly through anything that you want to focus on or you have any thoughts, just let me know. And we can spend a little bit more time on that because honestly, we could probably do a whole day workshop just on physical stuff. Okay. Um, I, I know how this works. We've all been doing Zoom for a long time. So there's times I'm going to ask you questions. I also realize I will likely not get answers. These are things to think about. You don't have to respond if you don't want to. I don't feel awkward about it. 
But these are things that we want to be thinking about uh, before we even get started. And as we're talking about the physicality of teaching, um, the first thing is, why are we here? Like, why would, why would we even be having a discussion about physical wellness and teaching? Um, at the end of the day, everything is tied in to people's physical wellness, the same way that everything is tied in to people's mental health and their wellness as well. And I'll explain that in a little bit. But really, we're here to focus on the physical side of things, also because this is something that's a little bit easier to control for some teachers. When we think about some of the challenges people face, it's harder to control than some of the physical stuff. It's a little bit more concrete. And many teachers have physical challenges in the classroom. That's why we're here. And this one you don't need to answer. Like when we think about what are the physical wellness challenges teachers face, when I ask people this question, a lot of the times people think, oh, well, you know, people get in car accidents and some people come back from cancer treatment. But honestly, it's it's huge the amount of physical challenges people face. And I think we saw that as we were all going into COVID, the amount of teachers who are teaching with pre-existing conditions, people who have autoimmune challenges, people who have fatigue challenges, people who have these conditions that they teach with on a day-to-day -day basis. We're also realizing the physical challenges that exist in some of the more non-traditional ways, things around neurodiversity and ADHD, and a lot of around like brain injuries and concussions. And so it's not just your standard, you know, I, I hurt my back and I need a chair, which is still a big part of it. The physicality of teaching is um, can come about through any disability, okay? When we oh, talk we about this- a few, a few responses come into your okay, first questions. Sure. Great. Uh, one, oh, one people are putting it in the chat. So I'm scooting yeah. ahead without reading the chat. Yeah. No problem, no problem. So yeah. one to have a long career and to be our best, and another one's mm -hmm. another one. Uh, there may be things we are doing in the classroom that impact on our physical well-being. Yeah, a hundred percent. And you know, I think it's a part that does get forgotten a lot as well. People just think like, well, this is just how it is. This is the part of teaching that I just have to deal with. My setup is how it is, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But you're right. You want to you want to be well in all areas, and that's why I'm presenting this. We're not going to go through this, this whole thing, this um, wellness wheel, but I'm presenting it for a couple of reasons. The first thing is just that when we think about wellness, even though we're focusing on physical, they're all really tied together. So this wheel is very neatly laid out, but really it's, it's a mishmash. They're all affecting each other. And our physical wellness can have a huge impact on the other parts of our wellness. So if we don't manage it very well, it can affect our mental health. It can affect our occupational wellness, really any of them. But our work can really be affected if we're not physically well. Going the other way, if our work is not great, we don't have a great occupational wellness, we don't have a great relationship with our jobs, our jobs are not contributing to our wellness, they're taking away from our wellness, well, that can affect our, us physically as well. So it can, it can exacerbate um, conditions we already have. It can cause conditions we don't have. Um, and it can add to sort of our physical challenges. So when it comes to wellness, what we're thinking about is having balance between all these things. We're focusing on physical today, and that's why we're here, but we can't ignore the fact that other things are going to have an impact on our physical wellness. The good thing about wellness though, when I think about what it means is, you know, a different than illness per se, is when it comes to wellness, we have some control over our wellness a lot of the time. We can choose and make choices that can help us be more well. So we can make choices physically that can help us be more well. It can be really hard. And sometimes it's something that requires a little bit of planning, but at least for if it's a wellness issue, we can sometimes make some changes. And that's hopefully well, something we'll think about today. So when we starting point for this is, okay, if, if I were to be a physically well teacher, what would that even look like? We're thinking about not just me as a person, we're also thinking about the space. We're thinking about how I interact with the space. We're thinking about what I do when I'm not teaching. So when we're thinking about a physically well teacher, it's not just about how I feel in any given moment. It's do I have balance with the wheel and what am I doing even outside of teaching and how am I, how am I interacting with my physical space? The other question is, is it even possible to be a physically well teacher? And the answer is maybe. I think it's really challenging, and we'll talk about some of those challenges. Uh, when you don't have school boards who are super open to providing all the equipment people need, they make teachers pay for their own things, the setups are terrible, you have chairs and tables and all these things from 1960. Like, 
is it possible to be really physically well? Uh, maybe, maybe not, but we can do a little bit better. And I think that's really the message today is not that we're going to be perfect, but we can maybe look at a few things that can help teachers be a little bit more physically well overall. All good so far, I see. I'll, I guess I'm on, I should take a look at the chat too, eh? Yeah, you know, so so <laughs> somebody said it, laughed out loud. Is laugh out loud funny? We say that with a lot of things regarding wellness and teaching. Obviously the big one is mental health too. Like, is it possible to be, you know, totally mentally, mentally well all the time? Probably not, but you know, it's something we can strive to do a little bit better at the end of the day. So I'm going to whip through this stuff, but I, I, I remember the first time I saw one of my teachers in a grocery store. That's true. Like I, re I don't have a lot of memories as a kid because I was a kid, but I do remember the first time I saw one of my teachers in a grocery store. We forget that teachers are people too. Now you don't, but the community forgets that people are teachers too. So when we talk about teacher wellness, a lot of the times we focus on just what's going on in the classroom and we forget that all of the same things that affect everybody else um, also are affecting teachers. So yes, there's the stress of teaching and yes, there's the physical challenges of teaching, but teachers also struggle with the same thing as everybody else around the big things, sort of eating and and maintaining a healthy eating style, nutrition, exercise, sleep, all the sort of physical illnesses and diseases that people get, cancer and heart, heart problems, and mental health. And there's a strong link between mental health and physical health, both in people's ability to engage in, in things that help them be physical well, and also when you don't feel great mentally, it's hard to feel great physically too. And also social health. And so the links between these things. Now, that's these aren't just teaching problems, but we do know that a lot of teachers really struggle with these things because they don't have the time, right? The average teacher works on average between 10 and 12 hours a day from what we see from the studies. So trying to incorporate all these healthy lifestyle things can be very challenging. So it's challenging for everybody, but it can what we know as people who work in education is it can be even harder for teachers. And that's why another reason why we have to have these discussions. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on nutrition and sleep and exercise. That's not really why we're here. And to be honest, I would be telling you a whole bunch of things you already know, right? We all know we're supposed to eat fairly well. We all know we're supposed to get around seven or eight or nine hours sleep. We all know we're supposed to do a little bit of exercise. What does that have to do with teaching? It has everything to do with teaching is if you're not doing these things, it's really hard to be physically well. Do you have to do them all at the level of, you know, an Ironman triathlete? You do not. But it's it's helpful for everybody to be managing their nutrition, to be managing their sleep, and to be managing their some level of exercise. And I think it's important to point out here that exercise and physical activity are two different things, right? Physical activity could be walking your dog, but that's not necessarily exercise unless you're you your heart rate up, you're you know, you're breathing heavy, like those kind of things, right? So and again, really hard to do when you're a teacher and you don't have time to do all these things. And that's where some of the challenges lie. So some of the challenges that people face in the classroom do directly stem from the challenges they face with managing these three things. It's not a lecture on nutrition, sleep, and exercise. That would be super boring. But the big question for these three, whether it's for you or for your colleagues, is not, are you getting proper nutrition? Are you getting proper sleep? Are you getting exercise? It's more likely why aren't you getting proper nutrition, sleep, and exercise? Because we all kind of know what we're supposed to do. So the bigger question is why aren't I? And that's the starting point for that. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, teachers, again, in Canada, most adults don't get enough sleep, but teachers definitely do not get enough sleep. Um, and of course they don't, especially if they have outside commitments. That could be family, could be other things they like to do, taking care of aging parents, um, you know, just trying to fit everything into 24 hours. It, it, when we do talks about balance, we'll put up all the things that people have to do in a day by the rules, and it's actually not possible. So it, it comes down to trying to figure out how do I balance out my life a little bit to, to focus on myself. When it comes to teachers, one of the questions that, you know, nobody really asks teachers is what do you need? Um, what can you do for yourself? in terms of managing these things is not the best question. People don't want to hear that, right? What can I do for myself? I'm always being asked to do things for myself, but it's still the question is, what do I need? And that kind of leaves people in a bad spot sometimes when they're teachers because nobody ever asked them that 
They just ask them to do more. So sometimes we have to ask ourselves. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good. We're going to talk about moving in a little bit. So yeah, like just taking that time. You know, we're going to jump around in here again. We're a small group, and I'll, I'll respond to the chat as we go because I like to be a little more informal. Um, if you took the time once or twice a week just to say like, okay, I'm going to take ten minutes for myself, which don't laugh. You you may or may not be able to do it, but it just take 10 minutes to do one thing for myself. These mm -hmm. little moments that we can take can sometimes make us feel a little bit better. Like it's not going to yeah. make you feel awesome. Um, but if there are like we talk a lot in the work I do with teachers about finding moments, moments to do this. Oh. Like to breathe, to connect with a colleague, which we're I'm not doing as much as we were doing before COVID. Um, moments to reposition ourselves and think about how am I working moments to get out of the classroom and go for a little bit of a walk like just it sounds so it sounds dumb and it sounds like yeah yeah what's the point but these little moments sometimes can help us feel the difference between being totally overwhelmed and just feeling slightly less overwhelmed like it's not I'm not Mary Poppins you're not going to like things aren't going to change just by doing these little things but we can feel a little bit better right a little bit better the physical risks that teachers face, it's a pretty long list, um, but really what it boils down to most of the time is pain and fatigue. Like those are, if we were going to categorize the challenges that teachers face, uh, break them all down, it's usually pain and fatigue. There are some sensory challenges that are a little bit different, uh, but really overwhelmingly the things that people struggle with are pain and fatigue. And that can be essentially in literally any body part. Um, it can it can be uh, caused by the environment. So if there's allergens, uh, people have different uh, scent uh, reactions, and that can cause sort of physical reactions. Um, people get headaches from lights, can be from smells, can be from like lots of different things, voice dysfunction. There's a lot of physical things that happen to teachers, but it usually boils down to pain and fatigue as being the two things that people try to manage. The specifics of how people can manage them are oftentimes um, illness or disability specific. So for instance, what would you do if you had rheumatoid arthritis? What if you have MS? What if you have a concussion? What if you have osteoarthritis? Like these are very specific, but the generalities are pretty much the same across the board for just about everybody. Um, it really comes down to trying to figure out a way to do things a little bit differently. And this, this is general, okay? So this is just the starting point you would get more into the specifics when you start looking at equipment, which we'll talk about specific pacing and positioning, um, and then specifics around um, your specific disability challenges. We'll just say disability as the umbrella. Um, but the generalities of managing this are very basic, yet so hard to do in the classroom. And we spend a lot of time just figuring out with people how they can do this, kind of like what we were just talking about, taking 10 minutes a couple of times a week just to and the main thing is just to slow down and take some breaks. The best way to manage pain and fatigue is to slow down and take some breaks. But it requires a little bit more than that. It requires some planning around what you need. Any type of plan, like any type of wellness, resilience, building resilience, building mental health, uh, making changes, this all requires some planning. So what we try to work with teachers on is when you sit down and you're doing your sort of daily plan, your daily curriculum, is thinking about what are you doing in there? So not just about what's happening for your students. Um, what is your day going to look like? Where are you getting five minutes? Where are you going to take a breath? Where are you going to be able to get up and walk? Where are you going to be able to sit? Like, what is what is your day look like? Um, even if you don't have any physical disability challenges, you want to stay that way. Are you planning a little bit around what you need to? We'll go through a few rules, but if you're spending your whole day standing and you're feeling really tired at the end of the day, it's a little bit on you, right? Like maybe there's a way to figure out, okay, could I sit a little bit here and there? And again, don't laugh. Um, with planning, you could probably figure it out a little bit. And if you're, again, if you're supporting colleagues, they might be able to figure out a little bit to make small changes, right? If you're sitting all day, get up and move around. If you're standing all day, sit down, like pretty basic, like these are some pretty basic concepts. And on considering ergonomics, and we're going to chat a little bit about ergonomics, and that's where I do want to get if there's any, if you do have any specific questions that we can focus on. But really ergonomics is sort of your relationship with your space and, and stuff. 
right? So what kind of stuff can people get that can help them be more effective teachers, right? Um, are you working too much to be well? And that's another, that's another physical question. Sometimes we have challenges where working 12 hours a day, five days a week, it's just not going to be manageable. It doesn't matter if I have $10,000 worth of stuff. It's also considering like, what do you need to balance out your wellness and your work? So for some people, that means not being full time. Some people, it means coming up with other, uh, finding another job or finding other schedules. Again, these aren't easy, but sometimes it is just as easy as I can't do this. If you tell me I have to throw a ball 200 miles an hour, I can't do it. So it doesn't matter how many times I try, I actually can't do it. So if I need to get a ball from here to there, I might have to figure out another way because I can't do it the way you're asking. So coming up with other options, right? Um, obviously the other stuff, talking to your doctor and going to rehab and physio and like these are all some pretty basic things, uh, participating in activities that make you feel well, give you positive energy. Um, and then yeah, sleep is actually a big part of managing physicality. So these are the basics. Um, you know, if you could even start with some of this, you'd have a pretty good start. Not rocket science, it's slow down. What do you need? Can you get some breaths in there from time to time? And then you start looking at the specifics of your own disability challenges around that. Um, any questions so far? Yeah, like so, so, so Charlotte's put out to everybody, like put yourselves in your day plan. Like we really try to get people to put their own time in their day plans. And, and if they can't like have it actually written in, having alarms, like we, we've had we've had teachers who do like mindfulness exercises with their class, where their class is all doing like these mindful activities and the teacher's kind of like sneaking and doing emails while their class is doing that. And I get it. Like I absolutely get like that's, there's five minutes here where I can maybe do a thing that I can get something done. But we try to encourage people like, why don't you also take that five minutes while your class is actually being quiet? and doing some mindfulness and try it for yourself. And yeah, maybe you stick around for five minutes longer at the end of the day, but maybe that actually helps you feel like you have a little more control during the day, right? Again, some of the things I say might seem like not possible, but maybe worth a try. Like I said, we're gonna zip right around. There's, when I first started uh, doing this job, uh, there was, my very first person was a long-term disability. And the long-term disability person said, what is the problem? Uh, teaching is a sedentary job. Okay, so that's the first thing they said to me. And I had just started in the role. And I was like, I don't think it's sedentary, but there's a little bit of physicality to it. And obviously, the more I've done this, the, the more ridiculous that sounds. The general public does not understand how physical teaching can be. Not every job is highly physical. Like, we know that. But if you add in somebody who has an injury or has a disability or has a pre-existing condition, the job then becomes more physical if, you're, if you have existing challenges. But some jobs just by their nature are super physical. And the, I think the most physical job is, and, and this is in general, is kindergarten. And people think that's funny. And the reason why I think it's the most physical job is because everything is super low, super stimulating, Kids are always moving and you are never working at a height that's even remotely like close to what would be an adult height. So it's constant bending, constant, constant um, leaning over, reaching, all that kind of stuff. But every job has its own level of physicality. Elementary students, things are getting a little bit louder. Still, things are still really low, but some things, you know, some of the kids want a little bit higher, uh, lots of constant movement. You're getting into middle school grades, like they, there's th constant changes. And again, you're not necessarily set up with the right equipment that you need in these cases. In middle school, you're also starting to get, again, in general, um, starting to get a, a bigger uh, break between uh, being able to manage some of the, the behaviors of students. You're starting to see students go in different directions a little more. So that becomes part of it. And then secondary, there's a whole like whole slew of, of physical challenges. A lot of it's in the more physical jobs, things like foods, which some people call home ec and tech ed, industrial ed and shop uh, art, like the things where people are on their feet and they're constantly moving. They might have to go and do their own, get their own stuff, um, do a lot of their own cleanup. Like these things are very physical, but you know what? So is teaching secondary math. Like if you're standing at the front of the room all day and you don't have the right equipment to do that, 
that can have a huge toll on how you feel physically, especially if you are injured or have a disability, right? So all the jobs have different challenges to them. No one job, again, I think kindergarten is probably the most, but you know, it's relative to this compared to this. Like every job in teaching has its own physical challenges. So it can be it can be affected by somebody's pre-existing condition or it can cause injuries and cause challenges for people from a physical standpoint. Every job, even what some people think of as the easy jobs, physically easy, being more some of the jobs that are more like in the office type environments, counseling and these things. Um, more people are injured working in offices than are, than are um, oftentimes in industry. And the reason for that is because of computers and we don't have a good way to set people up on computers after all this time. So there's a lot of like, you know, um, non-moving injuries that people get. So every job has its own physicality. And it's if you're in one of these roles, it's thinking, what are the physical challenges in my job that might be affecting me? Not just like I'm tired or not just like I'm uncomfortable. What specifically about your role is making you feel that way? That's a pretty good place to start. I'm not going to do all of the duty to accommodate talk, but I do want to mention a few things about duty to accommodate. It's a term that I think most people have heard. I'm not sure it's a term that everybody fully understands when it comes to this, but when it when it comes to physical stuff, it's where I hear it thrown out the most. When people say, the, I need a chair, um, the, 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 the school um, district, school division, the board, whatever you, terminology you use, um, has a duty to accommodate that. They have to buy me my chair, okay? Or I need to, uh, I need to change my classroom for physical reasons. The board has to do this, okay? So that all comes from the idea of duty to accommodate. I do agree that um, a lot of the physical adaptations that we see and the physical accommodations we see do come from, from what's called duty to accommodate. And essentially, if you don't know, duty to accommodate in schools is the same as anywhere else, is employers in Canada have a duty to accommodate their employees to the point of undue hardship, okay? So it really just says that if somebody has a medical need for something as an employer, you're supposed to try to accommodate them. And it's, hardship's different for everybody. The school boards uh, always claim hardship based on finances as a first step. Um, again, they're not they're not bad people. I don't I don't I don't school board bash. Um, oftentimes they're really good allies in what we do, um, but oftentimes they'll they, they'll talk about money and these things. But we we know that when it comes to accommodation for teachers, the actual money part of it is is oftentimes less than two or three sick days at the most. So keeping somebody at school pays off. Um, so the cost of some equipment is usually less than a couple of sick days at the end of the day. But you know, for, for some employers, when we are asking for some things, it can be hardship, but really it's a hard line to hit. The initial considerations when we think about equipment and physicality and duty to accommodate is most school boards, like they're actually not terrible with this stuff when they need to be, when they need to be helping people, they usually will do it sometimes begrudgingly. But you know, if somebody comes back from hip replacement surgery, they're usually set up with what they need. Where we find people are not set up with what they need was when it's more invisible or disabilities that are maybe not as common or requests that are not as not as common. But school boards, by and large, they get that helping people um, to be well is in their best interest. So maybe not your board, um, but by and large, our, our experience across the country is most of the time they get it because also it's it's kind of the it's it's the rule, right? It's legislation, so they might not want to do these things, but they know they kind of kind of have to. The union plays a role. Teachers have to play a part in it. So it's not just about what a teacher wants. It's about what's required in this situation. And I think the important point for the talking about when you're thinking about your own needs or the needs of other people is there's a difference between duty to accommodate and an accommodation request. Oftentimes when we're dealing with stuff, things that can help a teacher be more well in their classroom, we're actually making accommodation requests. Right. So whether it's through the principal, uh, whether it's through health and safety, whether it's uh, through the union, through the district, through the through the board or through the district, like oftentimes we're making an, an accommodation request for uh, a keyboard or a table or to have some sound paneling put up. We don't often get to the point where we're throwing out duty to accommodate one of, you know, one of the one of the, the best ways to actually not have duty to accommodate accommodated is to start throwing out duty to accommodate like the term duty to accommodate. So oftentimes we're, we're requesting accommodation 
from the school boards. But we have to keep in mind that they, the school boards don't have to do anything. An employer doesn't have to do anything. And this is very frustrating because the message that some people get around this, the physical stuff is that if my doctor says I need it, then the board has to provide it. And this is not true, okay? So it's better if we can go through informal processes of being accommodated. If you have to get to formal processes, that's fine. And some boards do want like, get me a note from your doctor that says you need a table and we'll go from there. But the general thought that if my doctor says this, then the, the board has to do it. They don't have to do it. There is no duty to accommodate police. So they don't have to really do anything. So we wanna be trying to work with people around these things where we can, okay? So as I was saying, um, uh, some of the misconceptions, I'll just mention quickly that if a doctor makes a recommendation it has to be followed, that doctors can actually say specifically like what people need to do around time off and equipment. And again, the boards will take this into account, but it doesn't mean they have to follow exactly what doctors say. That is not, that's just not the way it works. It's not due to accommodate. Where we see that often is, in, for example, if a doctor says this teacher could teach grade two, but not grade three, okay? That, that would be a hard, thing to be medicalized. In some cases, that might be the case. But to say medically, from like duty to accommodate, you have to accommodate that person into grade two, not grade three. From a physical perspective, that would be very hard. It'd be actually easier to, to have accommodated from a mental health perspective. But from a physical perspective, that would be really hard. Okay? So just being aware that, you know, just because the doctor said that doesn't mean that that's the way it is. Okay. We're gonna get into some of the actual stuff of ergonomics. There's a few rules that are important when we talk about physicality. Ergonomics is essentially just how we work with stuff, right? It's our relationship to the things we work with. And the goal at the end of the day is to increase comfort and prevent injury. I would say it's about half and half of the people that I see for purely ergonomic reasons I'd say about half of them come with existing injuries that their job is exacerbating or making it difficult for them. And I'd say half that the job is actually causing or, or really adding to their challenges, right? So we're trying to increase comfort and prevent injury, but it all starts with the person, okay? So you can get, again, you can have a board spend $10,000 on setting up a classroom and getting everything a person needs, and it doesn't do anything if the teacher doesn't actually use it correctly. So there's a few rules I'm gonna go through quickly here. And I'll end up skipping some slides because I always have stuff in case people have questions. But there's a few rules that we're going to go, go through. And But the starting point for anything physical, always remembering if you're thinking about what do I need, how can I make improvements, and it's gravity. Gravity is the enemy of physical pain, okay? And the reason for that is because gravity is way harder than we think it is, and it's constantly trying to push us down. So if I were to say to you right now, take your iPhone or take your phone and put it two feet above a sidewalk and drop it, you would not do it because it would break. And the reason it would break is because gravity is really hard, okay? Now we don't realize it day to day because we this is where we've all been born and where we grew up, but it's actually really hard. But our bodies notice it, especially if we start to be injured or fatigued because we're constantly working against gravity, okay? So what we're talking about, this is my high-tech example of what this looks like. What we're shooting for when we are teaching is to be in what's called a neutral position. So neutral position is when gravity is going straight through you, okay? The floor is pushing back up, gravity is going straight through you. Many of you right now are sitting with your hands in your laps, or on an armrest. And the reason why you're doing that is because you're putting yourself in a neutral position. None of you are sitting like this right now. And the reason for that is because you would then be working against gravity, okay? So when we think about how do we minimize gravity and how do we get into neutral positions, our body's doing a lot of equal work, okay? So the muscles of my neck, the back of my neck, and the front of my neck are doing about the same amount of work. The muscles in my core and in my back are doing about the same amount of work, especially when I'm standing. So we don't get stuck in any one position being locked off, which is what happens when we start to lean forward. So if this is front. Once I, now gravity is going straight down through me. As I start to lean forward, even a little bit, now gravity has got my whole, the whole of my back, the whole of my backside here. And the only way I, I'm prevented from falling on my face is to lock, start locking things off. 
So how teachers end up teaching all day is with these little fists of locked off muscles all over their body. And if I told you to make a fist right now and open it in 10 minutes, even if it wasn't super hard fist, it would be hard to do. But yet we work in positions because of we're forced to by our equipment or just we were working with small people and also teachers sometimes like overreach. We were trying to build rapport, trying to show that we care about students, like just spending their whole day bent over when maybe don't need to, we can be more neutral is we end up getting these injuries and this pain that's the result of actually not moving. It's the result of having these locked off areas. When you have an injury or you have a disability, um, it even becomes more when you're working against gravity all day. So we want to find the positions where we're neutral. That's the starting point for figuring out like how can I be more comfortable, right? So it's gravity. So the way we do that is just by thinking about what am I doing at the end of the day? Why am I working in the position I'm working in right now? Do I need to be leaning forward with these students? Do I need to be like when I'm talking to my student who's in grade, it doesn't matter what grade, I guess, do I have to be leaning forward or can I be more upright? Like, why am I putting myself in these positions? When I'm working on my desk, um, am I working really far away from my body or am I working really close to my body? Because there's a, you know, a few rules we want to keep in mind. One is, what am I doing? But the other one is just by working close to my body, I'm putting myself in a better uh, possibility of being in a neutral position. The farther I get away from my work, the harder it is to work close and be neutral. And you can just do it yourself. Just stick your arms out. Right. If your arms are here, your shoulders and your neck aren't doing any work, especially if you like get your shoulders down. But as soon as you reach out a little bit, something has to get my shoulder in that position. So something is working and also something is locking it off. So it, it's not like the same as running a marathon, but time after time, day after day, hour after hour in these positions, we can start to be pretty uncomfortable. So it's working close. And what I tell people is just use T-Rex arms when you can. It's that simple. Again, not rocket science. Try to work close to your body, work through your elbows instead of always being bent and reaching where you can try to work close to your body. Biggest rule for ergonomics though, is the other ones don't matter if you don't do this and you have to change positions. So we say, you'll, you'll, if you look online, it'll say take breaks. Breaks isn't necessarily the right terminology. It's, it's taking breaks from static positions. So a static position is a position where you're not moving. Um, a dynamic position is a position where you're moving. So, so if you're sitting for you know 25 minutes nonstop, it's time to get up and move around. If you're standing for 25 minutes nonstop, it's time to sit. Like it's changing positions. If you have an injury, making sure you're actually moving your shoulder if your shoulder's injured. Make sure you're stretching your back through a full range of motion that's comfortable for you if your back is injured. If you're super fatigued, being extra mindful of how much time you spend standing still without without walking or sitting. Like these are the things we want to be like being mindful of how much time we're spending in static positions. And if you get to the point where, okay, now I'm feeling pain, I'm going to change, it's probably a little bit too late. Okay. So being aware of what your own time limits are and trying to change positions often. This is how we manage the physicality of teaching, regardless of what the disability is, pain, fatigue, all this stuff that we could talk about if we had a whole day. It's work, what are you doing against gravity? Work close to your body where you can, make sure you're moving around. And just these three things alone can make some pretty big differences for people who, people, you know, teachers get stuck in doing things a certain way and it's hard to sometimes change it. But if you're mindful of what you need, what do I need? And maybe if you put it into your own planning, around, okay, I know for this section of my day, I'm going to be standing for half an hour straight. Where in the middle can I find two minutes to sit down? And just being mindful of what do you need. Easier said than done. I know that. A few other rules to think about before I kind of go through a, a few specifics is also thinking about sort of where you work. So I went in to see somebody the other day. This is true. It's not, this is the made up story. I went in to see a teacher the other day uh, she teaches uh, grade three. And I went into her room and she had a pretty good table and she had a document camera and she had her laptop set up pretty well for laptops. Laptops are great. But she was sitting facing the wall. So she was facing the wall. Her classroom was behind her. All of her classes behind her. The, the board was over here. So it was projecting onto the screen over here. And so the only way that she could see was to constantly be working like this and turning her body 
and spinning around and looking over up here. And she was saying to like, I'm really uncomfortable while I'm working. And like, when I say it to you and I said it to her afterwards, like it's, she laughed. She's like, I don't know why I'm doing this. Like why? And the reason why she was doing this is because her cord didn't reach. So she couldn't move her table around so that she faced out into the classroom because her cord didn't reach. Teaching is overwhelming. Something as simple as I need a new cord can be the difference between being comfortable and not comfortable. And so, you know, again, it was kind of funny after the fact, we just found another cord, turned her around. And this is the part you're maybe not gonna love. If she had to buy her own cord, because it would have taken too much time, too many steps, the board wouldn't buy it, the principal wouldn't organize it. In this situation, it probably would have been worth it. I'm not telling you to go out and buy your own equipment. What I'm saying is, if nobody else is going to ask you what you need, if nobody else is looking out for what you need, if there's not a process for that to happen, you still might need to do something if you want to feel physically more well. So I'm not saying buy your own stuff, but what I'm saying is, if you need something, you may want to consider doing what you need. Um, I, I don't want everybody mad at me, <laughs> but for her, she needed to spin around and face class. And it was pretty, and then from there, we were able to make a few other adjustments and she feels way better now. But sometimes it just takes a minute to think about why am I doing what I'm doing? What position am I in? What's gravity doing? Am I working close to my body? Am I neutral? Like if she had just asked herself that question, the spinning around the whole day, she would have said, no, that's not, that's not neutral. How do I get neutral? Does that make sense? Right. So choosing your location, and I'm all for creating one workstation. So you'll see people who have like their desk and then they have a spot at the front and then they have another little spot at the side. And I'm just like, create one workstation, have yourself perfectly set up there as well as you can and then cycle through the room as you need to. But I'm all about like having a workstation as opposed to just a desk. Obviously for that to happen, your heights need to be somewhat aligned. Um, we won't get into all of this, but if you're, if you're, you know, if you're a super tall person and you're working way down low, or if you're a shorter person and you're working way up high, it's really hard to be neutral if you can't get yourself aligned to the surfaces you're working on. So the rule is about 90 degrees at your elbows with whatever you're doing if you're on a desk surface, okay? How are we doing for time? Oh, we're good. Like I said, flying right along. If you have any questions or anything you don't agree with, just jump right in. Um, those rules around positioning are super important, but again, I cannot say how Again, we've talked about it a little bit, how important it is what we call to pace yourself. Again, super hard to do, especially if you're injured though, it's thinking about what do I need to do to get some breaks here and there for myself. Oftentimes you'll hear people, if you go to physio, they'll say take micro breaks, meaning even like a minute here and there, but really finding times to change positions, get into, get into a position. Even if you like, some teachers will lie down at lunch for five or 10 minutes on a yoga mat, close the door, do some breathing. Not everybody can do that and not in every role, but if it's something that you could do, you can even do it in a chair, just find a few minutes. It's about pacing. It's about thinking about what am I doing during my day? How does a kindergarten teacher pace? How does an art teacher pace? How does a math teacher pace? There's ways to do it. It's taking some time and thinking about what does my day look like? Where am I gonna get some breaks? What do I need? Oh yeah, I'm important too. It's better to have you there and maybe stealing two minutes of your student's time in the middle to actually sit down than to have you at home because your neck got so bad it seized up and you couldn't teach at all, right? So thinking about these, these moments that you might need, right? And some people, they'll set reminders, they'll put it in their calendar, they'll set up rewards like, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm going to do this twice a week and then you know, I'll, 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 do, I'll lay down at lunch twice a week. And if I do that, then I, you know, I'll set up some kind of reward system where I'll, I'll be able to do whatever it is, like trying to encourage themselves to do things different, okay? So it's not just about stuff. It's about how I position myself and do I take some breaks from being in static positions and do I sit sometimes? It's very rare. It's, it's you know, in, in, the, in the outside world, um, you hear a lot of people say we sit too much. Most, te most teachers do not sit too much. Most teachers stand too much. So we actually, we oftentimes are encouraging teachers to sit more. Again, in the outside world, you hear more about people needing to move. That's not our experience. There are some jobs where teachers sit a lot and they do need to move more, um, but that's that's the rarity. Most jobs are pretty active. People are, or people are at least changing positions, um, even if it's like in a learning assistance resource position, 
the teacher's up, they're sitting for a bit, they're getting other kids, like whatever they're doing, they're moving around a fair bit. Okay. Again, we're zipping right along. I'm going to just go through a few specific things. Some of this you might already know. And at the end, when you have questions, if you're interested in like, what would be good for me? We may not be able to answer fully because I don't have your whole history, but we can start that process if you have questions for yourself. But in general, what we start thinking about stuff, because it's one thing to be like, I'm in the right position. And, but if you don't have the proper way to facilitate yourself being in the right position, then that can really work against you. There are different processes in different districts for how this happens. My advice for you is if you are a person you don't know, like I don't know how to get this stuff that I might need, start with your local union office, um, with your bargaining unit and start with them and they will be able to tell you what you need, whether it's medical provided from uh, your doctor, whether it's they have an assessment process, whether it's just that, that your, your local president can talk to the, to the board, like they'll have, people have different processes depending on who you work for. Um, but there's some pretty standard stuff. And so when we just think about the basics and there's overlap between all of these uh, categories that I have here, but um, there's some pretty standard stuff that we talk about in terms of helping people be more comfortable when they have more serious physical challenges, disabilities um, and illnesses. Everything starts though, even for teachers, everything starts with the chair, okay? So this chair here on the wooden chair here on the right, that's you're all more likely to have that chair than the chair on the left. When of course everybody should have the chair on the left. Now, not everybody can get the chair that's on the left because if the school boards were to buy everybody that chair, it would cost millions of dollars, so they don't. So what they do is they wait until people need them. Obviously, there's some huge differences between these two chairs. I will say that this chair here on the right, this wooden chair, is better than this chair. And the reason why this chair on the right is better than this chair and the way it's set up is because this chair is just a gimmicky, marketed staples chair, which is all about bells and whistles, but doesn't actually offer any functionality, especially the way it is set up here. So when you're getting a chair, if you get a chair, it's important to make sure that the chair works for you. Okay, now the more adjustments, the better to a point, but 99% of people don't need a headrest. 99% of people don't really need a, a back this big. Um, you know, if you can have like mesh backs and leather this and leather that, and really you just need a functional chair, kind of like this one that allows you to work in this position. That's it, where your back is supported and your butt is supported. That's kind of what you need from a chair where it's it's not leaning back, uh, which a lot of chairs are. Um, it's upright and allows you to work in an upright position. So when you when the first thing when you're looking at chairs is can you sit up straight? Okay, is your low back supported? Essentially, the way to 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 figure it out is are you at 90 degrees on all your key joints, ankle, knee, hip, elbows? If you can work at 90 degrees with those joints, then the chair is in probably in the right position for you as you can see here, right? So we don't need bells and whistles. You don't even maybe need armrests. Like we just need something that has some cushioning that allows you to sit upright, that has some wheels, that allows you to be in the right position. So many times I'll go in to see people's classrooms and even if the school has actually like, this, oh, my principal got this for me, but the chair, it's not the right chair. It looked good because it looked good, but functionally it wasn't good. The back didn't come straight. It didn't go to the right height. Uh, it didn't have the right adjustments for the seat to slide out perhaps. So the person was like way too big for it. These are the things that we need to be mindful of when we think about chairs. So it's not just about go buy yourself a chair. It has to be the right chair. Now, it doesn't have to be an $800 chair. Like anything is better than the crappy chairs people sit on sometimes, but you know, the more that you can get, the better. Um, the other thing that I'm just gonna mention a little bit here about equipment is just around um, uh, the mouse and how important it is when people who have positioning challenges. Peter, I'll, I'll just, can I just take two more minutes? We good for that? Lots of time, no worries. Okay, and there's, there, I'm just showing this slide specifically because there's a lot of different things out there that can help people be in positions that you might not even be aware of. So it's, I have this slide specifically with the message of you, probably don't know what you don't know. 
So if you're uncomfortable, you need to ask somebody who knows what they're doing, not maybe your colleague or your aunt, <laughs> right? Like ask somebody who actually knows something about this stuff because there's so many things out there that could work for you. Also, what works for your colleague might not work for you, okay? So it's important to be like, some of you know exactly, some of you may own a mouse like this, but others are saying like, I've never seen anything like that. And I purposely put this here because something like a mouse can be super important, but it's also something that you might need some input on. You just can't go and buy it yourself, okay? Um, I will just add for standing, standing is overrated. Everybody should have the ability to stand, okay? Everybody should have the ability to stand, but we don't wanna be standing all the time and it's not necessary for everybody in every teaching job, okay? So it's, your doctor might say, oh, you have back pain, get a standing desk. Yeah, okay, that would be nice, but it might not even work for you. So just prescription for standing, again, needs to go through kind of the right people. The standard equipment for teachers, chairs, tables, desk, rolling stool, super helpful, especially at elementary, rolling stools, monitors, like the stuff you would see in offices, but they're used like somewhat differently. Anti-fatigue mats for people to stand on if they have like joint issues or, or chronic pain, fatigue. Uh, drafting chairs to get a little higher. Document cameras. Like these are the standard pieces of equipment that people will get in classrooms. Technology is where things get a little bit more challenging because it's usually more expensive, but technology is your friend when it comes to managing physical challenges. The more you can do with technology, the less you're doing with your own body, the easier things get. So there's like, we can't go through the whole list of all the technology. Document camera is actually the by far the, the number one piece of equipment that every single teacher should have is a document camera to manage the physicality of work because you can sit, have a workstation, and do all your work in one place, okay? So, but there's a lot of different, even up here I've had, this is called a smart pen, this up here, that actually can record conversations, you have to get permission, and then whatever you write can then go straight into your computer. So for people who have different challenges around brain injuries, um, uh, might even be around um, different physical processes around writing can be or keyboarding can be a huge uh, help. The, this thing here is a table mic that can you can put in the middle of a classroom that connects directly to people's um, hearing aids if they're having challenges around hearing. There's just so much tech out there that can help. It's more expensive, sometimes requires more uh, of a process, but it can definitely be helpful by considering tech options. There's also the last two things I'll talk about super quick about accommodation for physical things is structural accommodation and sensory accommodation. These are also physical. So things like sound paneling would be structural accommodation for people who are struggling with hearing challenges, voice challenges, ADHD, um, even anxiety by being able to quiet a space can, can be an accommodation that would be a fair request. Um, changing the structural space, ducting and that kind of stuff. And lighting. Lighting is a topic all to itself, but lighting can have a huge physical um, toll on people, headaches, uh, inability to focus, anxiety. And it's a, it's a problem with neurodiversity too, is lighting. So both structural and sensory challenges um, really come into play. And there's, there's things that you can do, like there's stuff out there that can help with this. There's, there's coverings for lights, there's noise reducing earplugs, um, there's things that you can do. So I think we're out of time. Again, it's a, it's a huge topic. I'm, I'm available for questions. At the end of the day, the physicality of teaching is about thinking, what am I doing? What do I need? What can I change? And if you need some support with that, by asking for help. If anybody was here at the beginning, Peter even said about a different topic, teachers don't like to ask for help don't like to ask for help, but it really is the only way to get change when it comes to managing the physicality of a classroom. So like I said, that's a lot of information in an hour. It's probably a five hour talk to get through all of this, all the specifics, but I'm available for any specific questions. Um, and I, I definitely appreciate the time that you've given me for sure. Yeah. Thank you so much, Wade, for this informative presentation. Um, no problem. Some of the things that I wrote down, taking regular breaks, alternating between sitting and standing, depending on your situation. Uh, I know in my own classroom, I was a, you know, quote, computer teacher. So I was sitting a lot, um, sitting actually too much. And um, yeah. so I had to get up more. Yeah. And 
Actually, it was kind of funny. Your chair, chair slide where you had the old wooden chair, that was exactly the chair that I had in my classroom. Yeah. And the new chair that you showed was exactly the chair that the school board ended up having to buy for me because of my back problems. There so you go. Yeah, I got a good chuckle go. about that. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, see the wood, I see the wooden chair a lot more. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. And in the end, I think the most important lesson is we have to take time to prioritize our health. Um, you know, even if it just means getting a longer cord, right? So we can be more comfortable in our workspace. What do I need? Like yeah. that, it's still, it comes down to that. What do I need? Keeping in mind the rules. Um, yeah. And then, and then saying to somebody, "This is what I need," and yeah. they might not get it, but you definitely aren't going to get it if you don't ask. Yeah. Right? So, oh, I wanted to ask you a question. Is that all right if I share your slides? I've uploaded yeah, your yeah, yeah, PDF for your yeah. slides. Okay. All right. So, in just a minute, I'll drop the uh, the link to that uh, in the chat for if, everyone. Yeah. Just the same. Same. Our rules around that are pretty straightforward. You can yeah. use them for anything you want. Just just mention they're from HumorWorks. Okay. That's it. Okay. Yeah. And I've also dropped a link for the evaluation form. So if everybody could just uh, maybe click on that. If you don't have a chance to fill in the form right away, you will get a, an email from uh, from OTF within a few days. Uh, it will have a link to the evaluation form. It'll have a link to the video. And when we post the video, we also post uh, notes um, from the session. And uh, there's also the link to the OTF Connects calendar. And actually, let me just pull up one more slide for us. So the next webinar is actually with Wade again, uh, Wellness Ooh. Trends Affecting Teachers in 2024, and that'll be happening exactly a week from today. So we hope to uh, yeah. see many of you out for that one. Yeah, the next ones are totally different. Um, uh, things like trauma, neurodiversity, um, concussion, brain injury, more specific. It's it's uh, uh, definitely a little bit different, but uh, still, yeah, important. 